the 70s, a decade that has a wide variety of styles in music, culture, uh, and mass media. The record industry comes into its own in the 70s, and it really, the counterculture of the previous decade, the 60s, opened up amazing doors for all kinds of changes. So the first few songs we'll spend some time with are quite uh, varied in their styles. You see a picture of some of the cultural faces of the 70s. Some social scholars call this a very self-centered decade, naming it the me decade, where some of the ideas of the 60s that did not pan out uh, change the viewpoints of people, they become a little more inward, and that will be reflected in some of the music of the, of the decade as well. Rock and roll is a huge business. In fact, it gets very bloated by the middle and end of the decade, becoming corporate rock that has a, a bit of a stranglehold on, on some of the bands that we'll encounter. Instead of AM, the FM radio becomes the place to go listen to music. Uh, with much better sound and many stations would play entire album sides. That leads us to the next bullet point in that the full album is really leading now in the 70s far over the 45 single that was dominating the 50s and the 60s. So it's a pretty complex decade. Uh, we'll take it little steps at a time um, and I said before the first few songs are pretty diverse as we'll see as we go along. So our first couple of songs is in the country category. Country really comes into its own in the 1970s with big mega stars who even had their own television variety shows. And this example of Glen Campbell fits that category very nicely. The song Rhinestone Cowboy was one of his many signature songs that he would often start his concerts with or open his television show that he hosted with as well. Pause the video and come on back and listen along uh, as you listen to Rhinestone Cowboy from 1975 and try following the bullet points you see in the PowerPoint and come resume the video after you've listened to a majority of the song. All right, so The Wrecking Crew was an incredible uh, collection of studio musicians uh, stationed or, or lit working here in Los Angeles. They were the backing band for Brian Wilson in his creation of Pet Sounds. They were the backing band for numerous acts, Sonny and Cher, uh, countless others. And Glenn Campbell had previously been a member of that incredible set of uh, studio musicians. Uh, he was a singer, a songwriter, but he does a lot of covered music as well. And as I mentioned before, he hosted his own television show. Some of the things you can hear in Rhinestone Cowboy in particular are a pretty high level of production. Uh, so he's a good example of how country music really has grown up from uh, string bands and hillbilly sounds to very highly produced music. On the other spectrum is Merle Haggard. Now, Merrill Haggard's story is pretty interesting. He'd had a really tough time as a teenager, uh, in and out of jail a number of times, has problems with addiction. He represents a little more of the old school or what is termed in the style category as hardcore country. He did write a lot about his true life experiences. He did represent the more of a blue collar, hardworking, kind of everyday Joe person. Um, and this is a form that we studied in unit one. We studied it and we called it AAA form or strophic form, which is the fancy name and music for it. If you remember from unit one, a coda, that's just a fancy music term for a, an added ending on it. Interestingly enough, um, Merle Haggard did actually have a bit of a problem with uh, marijuana. And in the opening lines of Oki from Muskogee, he's poking fun at hippies. There's still hippies in the 70s, and actually his song is from 69. So he, he claims that they don't smoke 
marijuana. That's one of his lines. But in reality, he actually personally did have a little bit of a problem with it. An oki is a derogatory term from someone from Oklahoma. It goes way back to the Dust Bowl times when so many of the central United States farmers were devastated because of the Dust Bowl and the destruction of their crops came out to places like California. We also grow a lot of food. Unfortunately, some of the already um, existing farmers and, and people working in the industry did not like the fact that people from the Midwest were coming out here and potentially taking their jobs. So they'd call them Okies. That was why it was considered a derogatory term. The great book, Grapes of Wrath, captures this time in our history very, very well. So by embracing a derogatory term like Okie from Muskogee, Muskogee is a, a, a part of Oklahoma, um, you reown it. It becomes yours, just like certain um, ethnic slurs and um, gender slurs become reowned by the community that they're in. So pause the video, listen to Okie from Muskogee, and come on back when you are done. So a very large category in the 70s is what's called the singer-songwriter. Enormous. Um, and this is a good representation of that idea of the 1970s being more inward, telling my personal story, or in the case of the singer-songwriters, their personal story. We've heard from Carol King before. She was part of the incredible writing team of Carol King and Jerry Goffin, who wrote for the Shirelles, who wrote all kinds of pop hits of the early 60s uh, out of the Brill Building in New York. By the late 60s and into the 70s, she is now performing her own music, um, telling her own story in her own way, and is enormously popular. This album uh, listed here in the slide is Tapestry. I highly recommend you read it. I mean, sorry, you listen to it. It's incredible. It is um, really her mature time period as a singer, songwriter, and performer. She does have some complicated harmonies, and so that adds a level of sophistication to the sound. And near the end, near the last verse, she adds a little bit of a, a high, high saxophone. I believe it's a soprano sax. It gives it a little bit of a jazz flow and, a, again, a more sophisticated sound to it. She won a Grammy for Record of the Year in 72. She goes on to be one of the huge leaders of women in singer-songwriter categories. In fact, there's a Broadway musical about her life, and she's been awarded multiple times for her incredible work. So pause the video again. Take a listen to It's Too Late off the album Tapestry, and come on back when you are ready to go forward. So we've heard from Marvin Gaye before in our class, way back when we met in person. He was part of one of our videos, and especially this particular album and this particular track off the album, What's Going On, from 71. He's a former Motown, well, he's still Motown at this time, let me correct myself there, uh, musician, songwriter, very intimately part of the Motown family. He's married to Barry Gordy's sister, who was the founder of Motown. And if you remember, Motown was pretty strict on not al allowing controversial subject matter in their early 60s music. But the times have changed, and Marvin has changed with it. If you recall, he was interviewed briefly in the documentary we watched about the reaction he had to his brother returning from the Vietnam War and the massive changes that his brother was experiencing. And the particular uh, perspective from his brother is, is captured in the song, What's Going On? So I put him in a category called Modernized Pop, Motown Pop, right there. See how I draw an arrow with a mouse? It's very exciting. Uh, some of the things that would have been difficult at first were the use of slang. You can hear that in sort of the party atmosphere that pervades this particular song. Barry Gordy was not very interested in, in 
embracing the, the slang of the counterculture. And it was Steve, uh, Smokey Robinson who went to Barry and said, hey, you know, Marvin is recording this incredible album. You should let him have it, you know, be on the Motown label. If you don't, you might be sorry. Because Marvin was going to create it no matter what. He wasn't sure where it would end up on what label. But through some of the negotiations and um, prodding of Smokey Robinson, he convinced Barry Gordy that he should allow it on the Motown label, and he was smart. So again, pause. Uh, you might want to pull up the lyrics for this one if you don't know them, but uh, listen to What's Going On from 1971 by Marvin Gaye, and come on back when you are all done. Another Motown find uh, is the great Stevie Wonder, who was merely a kid and a teenager in the 60s. He comes absolutely into his own maturity in the 70s, creating some of his most epic albums. Talking Book, if you, if you own one Stevie Wonder album, uh, highly it's recommended to get Talking Book, which is pictured in front and center on your slide. Later in the decade, in about 76, he does a double album called Songs in the Key of Life. Also incredibly, incredibly gifted and a great, great double album. And uh, Music of My Mind, really, really great too. You really can't go wrong with any th one of these three or really anything that Stevie Wonder touches. So off of um, Talking Book is the famous song, probably well known to some, called Superstition, which is showing some of Stevie's really innovative experimentation with extremely early synthesizers. They were rooms at this time. Um, Stevie Wonder, I need to remind everyone, is blind, blind from birth. Uh, he had a team of, of helpers that would put in the patch codes, that, or chords and things that are needed for the early, early synthesizers. These weren't keyboarded, computer-looking beasts quite yet. They were literally rooms almost the size of a of a person's standard bedroom. So he was really innovative in experimenting with them. This is one of those albums where he, he initially, in the studio, played every instrument himself. Of course, live he would have a, a band with him. And there's a sound in Superstition of a unique keyboard called the clavinet keyboard. Keyboards have a different sound just like different guitars have a different sound or different people's voices have a different sound. Hammond organs have a different sound compared to a clavinet. Roland keyboards have a different sound. And so there's people in the keyboard world <clears throat> begin to um, play around with those different sounds. So something that happened with Motown's relationship and Stevie was unprecedented at the time. Barry Gordy allowed him in complete total artistic freedom. He'd been a bit controlling in his early years at, as the head of Motown in the 60s, but by now, rather than lose an artist as incredibly talented as Stevie Wonder, he gives him full artistic freedom. Pretty unusual for any time in history, but particularly um, in the hands of Barry Gordy. So again, pause, listen to Superstition. It's a great song with lots of good funk elements to it and come on back after you've listened. All right, our last uh, artist in this short part one section is Elton John, who in uh, the 70s becomes a superstar. Uh, there's a really good f m film about him, Rocket Man. If, if anyone has not seen it, I highly recommend it. It is not a documentary. And in fact, it's presented in kind of a musical format, but it's really well done and it captures some of the flamboyance of Elton John, who um, kind of straddles categories. We put him in a 70s pop for this particular song, which actually looks back to in influences from as far back as the 50s. Um, even the, the, the lyrics, I remember when rock was young, you know, is reminiscing about a simple maybe a simpler time in, in rock's history but he really bridges the gap between sort of pop songs and um a little bit of glam because of his stage presence his crazy outfits and um crazy uh, eyeglasses and hats and all kinds of wonderful things that elton john brought to the stage 
So again, pause the video, listen along, uh, enjoy the wonderful music of Elton John, and he always used the lyricist Bernie Toppin, who is a lifelong friend, of course, and colleague at this point. So come on back after you listen to a little bit of Elton John. All right, so that ends uh, part one. My goal is to put these slides in a little smaller, more manageable chunks so you don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, you can fast forward, you can rewind, and uh, go on to part two when you're ready. See you in part two, everybody.